know what the Coast Guard promises you when you enlist nowadays, but back then the Navy promised you travel, earn a trade, excitement. Well, I had traveled already more than all my family put together. They had taught me a trade, and this was more excitement than I expected, and a lot sooner than I expected it. <laughs> I have always been an early riser, being on the farm. You, you learn to get up early, because as soon as you're big enough to do work, there's big work for you to do. And the more you do, the more there is for you to do. So I'd gotten up early that morning, been to the mess hall, had my chow. Uh, I don't know, don't remember exactly what it was. Uh, we, we get a lot of uh, what they called SOS those days. I don't know if they still serve it to you today, but anyway, we were familiar with that. Uh, I had got down to the hangar early and had went in, in an upper level office, the personnel office, uh, on the southeasterly end of the building 54, which was 23's hangar. Um, Aerial Patrol Squadron 24 was on the other end, 21 and 22 was in Building 6, what they call Hangar 1, on the real, right out on the harbor inlet end of the island. Uh, I, prior to getting into the Navy, I don't think I had seen a typewriter. And I'm going to go up there and see if I can type a letter to my dear sweet mother and really impress her, you know. And I'm up there in the office and I'm using what they call the hunt and peck system. Now I think back then if you could type 40 words a minute, you were considered an expert typist. It was maybe taking me about four minutes to do a word, but I was proud of my progress and I was going along. I hear the sound of an approaching aircraft in the background, but that's not unusual. We're a naval air station, airplanes come and go, you know, and I continue with my project there that Airplane sound got louder and louder and louder, and I'm thinking, oh, well, okay. Uh, a couple of the hangars had left the harbor just a couple of days before to deliver aircraft to Midway and to Wake Island, uh, this fighter aircraft that can't fly that distance under their own uh, fuel. So the carriers were delivering them, and I thought they were returning, and as normal procedure, they launched their aircraft while they're still out at sea. They didn't have catapults then, so those planes took off under their own power. They had to have that added speed of the carrier in order to get off the deck. Um, and I thought, okay, they've launched them. They come in, they operate off of the air station while the ship is in harbor. Otherwise, they're uh, <coughs> useless on the deck of that ship. And by then I had learned to identify the sound of an aircraft. You could tell the difference, takeoff sound, level flight, or when it was in a dive. And suddenly the change of sound of that engine and that airplane changed and I knew it was in a power dive. And I thought, oh boy, one of these, one of these flyboys from that air group is gonna do a little hot dog. And because, you know, usually you're restricted to pretty uh, consistent flight patterns while you're flying military until you get into a dogfight or something like that. But I thought one of these guys is doing a little hot dogging to break the monotony and, and he's doing a little power dive and I'm thinking, boy, this guy is really going to be in trouble with the captain once they get to him. <laughs> little did I know that it was those of us on the ground who were suddenly going to be in trouble. Suddenly and almost simultaneously there was this tremendous roar and bomb fragments, explosion debris, and window glass came crashing into the back of my head, ears, neck, and onto my shoulders. Uh, you know, it kind of startles you. You don't know what's going on. Uh, I, I gathered myself back together a bit, and, and I'm still thinking it's one of our, our air group flyboys, and I'm going to go down and see if I can be of some help. Uh, I pushed myself back from that desk. It's, it was now all covered with debris, that, that uh, low spot in the front of those old manual typewriters, I think it was an Underwood, or I forget what the other one was called, uh, was 
full of glass and other debris and whatever, and it's all over the place. And I, but I got up and shook much of that debris off as I could and started for the door. It's then that I thought, oh boy, I could be in trouble for being up here using this typewriter. I'm not authorized to use a typewriter. So I reached back, grabbed that unfinished letter, ripped it out of that typewriter carriage, crumbled it in my hand, threw it in a basket as I went out the door. Once I got down on the lower level, I went out through the narrow opening left at the unclosed end of the rolling hangar door. The sound of another aircraft. I comes this airplane in a rather steep power dive, and I'm seeing what I thought was blinking, flashing lights on the front, and I'm hearing strange popping, buzzing, and whizzing sounds all about me. But I'm a recent farm boy, never been to war before. I don't recognize those sights and sounds for what they are. A little later, someone told me those what I thought were blinking or flashing lights were machine gun muzzle flashes, and those popping, buzzing, and whizzing sounds that I was hearing were those machine gun bullets striking and ricocheting off the hangar door right behind me and off the concrete apron on which I was standing. But since I didn't recognize them for what they were, they were no danger to me. My, my interest is drawn to that big old bomb hanging there in the bottom of the fuselage between the fixed landing gear and that old Val dive bomber. Suddenly that bomb released, it wobbled as it began to fall, and, and that airplane began to pull out of its dive. By the time it was in level flight, it couldn't have been much more, even if 100 feet over my head. It's then that I first saw and recognized that big round red insignia on the bottom of the starboard wing. That and the fact that it has just dropped a bomb has convinced me, that even this farm boy, that these are not the friendly fellows I thought they might be. I turned around, hurried back inside the hangar, hoping I could find someone with a key to the ammo shack. All of our guns and ammo was locked up, and I thought we could maybe do something, put up a little bit of a defense. But as I came in that front door, the other few that I was on duty with that morning were heading out the back door. Someone, I suppose the duty officer, spotted me and said, hey, you, follow me. I went after them. They ran out the back door, jumped to an on-field construction ditch out behind the hangar. I jumped in after them. Since I'm just coming in the front door when they're going out heading near the back, I'm about the last guy in that ditch. When I hit the bottom of that ditch and got myself stabilized a little bit, I'm looking right at a guy sitting there in a white uniform, the Liberty uniform, the dress uniform, like he's going into Honolulu or going to church or something. You know, the work uniform was those old bell-bottom blue dungaree trousers and blue.